All right, um, we're dealing with the issue of men, discipling men in sound doctrine. America, uh, you might say the world, has a problem when it comes to men, right? Um, in America, you're not allowed to be a man anymore. You, you know that? You're not allowed to be a man anymore. Um, the gender lines are being blurred, and you might say obliterated, and this is, this is the agenda. This is part of the agenda of the political left as well. So this is not going to be a political message, but let's face the facts. That's where it is. In fact, to call for masculinity or femininity uh, is considered hate speech by some people's opinions on the left today. And so men are becoming increasingly more feminine while women are becoming increasingly more masculine. And it's happening in such a subtle way around us that a lot of us can't even really realize it. We don't even realize the subtle things that happen that really are, were, move, were moves that kind of were trying to blur the lines. Uh, for instance, uh, it can show up in the way we dress or act. And I'm not one of those guys. It's like, you know, women aren't allowed to wear pants or anything like that. But there are certain outfits that are popular among women today that's origins were in the feminist empowerment movement, like, like the, uh, the what's that called? The woman, the one, the jumpsuit, the woman's, the, the one that Hillary would wear. The, it's like a jumpsuit. It's like a one-piece pantsuit. I thought that was like a two-piece thing. Wasn't a pantsuit a two-piece two, two thing? This is the one-piece thing. It's like a one, it's almost like whatever, jumper or something. I don't know what it's called. What's it called? Do you know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> We're going to call it pantsuit. And, and other things, you know, <clears throat> even, even in some of the, you know, again, I'm not one of these like, you know, independent fundamental, you know, I, listen, I'm independent fundamental, don't get me wrong, but I'm not one of those guys that like makes all of your opinions equal to conviction, but there are even some like, like hairstyles that are really connected with, for instance, the feminist movement. And so sometimes you, you, go, you go through town and you, 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 know, you think you're looking at a woman and you're actually looking at a man. And, uh, and that's becoming pretty popular. And then you think you're looking at a man and uh, you know, it turns out, it's, 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 they put people on television, you're like, is that a man or a woman? I don't know. I don't know if it is, what it is. And, and, and they want it that way. They want it that way. They want to blend the lines between, or, or blur the lines, or obliterate the lines between the sexes. And, and I would say it's, it's, again, like I brought up last week, like that frog in boiling water thing, where it's like little by little, you, 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 know, you turn up the heat. I don't know if that's an urban legend or if that's legit or not. I, I, I don't claim to be an expert on, you know, on frogs. But, um, but the, the saying goes something like, you know, you turn the water up and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and, you know, the frog doesn't know it and then the frog's dead, right? So, so it's, it's just like this kind of gradual thing that you don't even recognize before it's too late. And, I, and I, th I think that's happened in our society. I really do. Go to another place in the world and uh, come back. <laughs> it's, a sh it's a shock, Okay. Go to another place in the world for a few weeks, like a, like a Middle Eastern country, and come back and, and go to Walmart, and you're just like, <laughs> what? You like kind of forgot how bad it was. And then you're here for a month, and you don't even remember, you don't even think about it, because you just blend in. You kind of like notice it. Everything blends in. Everything looks the same. Men don't look, look like men anymore, or act like it, for that matter. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and so America, you might say the world, or many parts of the world, the, West, the Western world has a problem when it comes to manhood. And the church has that problem as well. Uh, there are so many men in, it might not be the exact same where, you know, men are becoming increasingly more feminine or whatever else, but, but men, it, it, men are a problem in the local church in that so many men are spiritually mature. So many men don't read the Bible. So many men are not committed to worship. They're hot-headed and impulsive. And you could say Christian men aren't like that. And I would say maybe, maybe they're not, but church people are, okay? And sometimes it's hard to tell which one is a church person and one, which person is a Christian. I can tell you how many church people men, churchmen, 
uh, have been very impulsive and hot-headed. Uh, men who aren't really walking with Christ. And today, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to Titus, writes about that just a little bit. And it's really all we're doing today is we're just looking at two verses. All right. Um, this letter... <coughs> This letter is written just a reminder after the book of Acts ends. Paul is released from prison. He, he's, he's left Titus on the island of Crete. And I'm not going to go over all that. If you want, to, you want some info on Crete or whatever, just go back and listen to the early messages here. He's left Titus on Crete to kind of fix some things. And Crete's not an easy place to minister. You know, this, uh, this is where the Philistines came from, you know, the Philistines that fought with Saul and the Philistines that fought with David and you know, not good dudes. Uh, Crete is full of uh, liars, evil beasts, and gluttons, lazy gluttons we saw in chapter one. But Titus is, he's the guy. Titus is the, is the perfect guy for this job. He's a seasoned veteran. He's, a, he's spiritually mature. He's been working with Paul for a long time. He's the guy to settle things in this island. And his, one of his main duties here is to appoint qualified men to be pastors in every town on the island of Crete. And he needs to expose and silence rebellious men and false teachers. So this message is about discipling men, or at least that's the title, Discipling Men in Sound Doctrine, but, but they're really, how we're going to handle these two verses tonight, there are two parts in that. There are two roles in that. The first role we're really looking at is what we see in verse 1, and that's, that's really the, the pastor's role what is the pastor's role in the discipling of men in sound doctrine? And again, we see that in verse 1. Uh, Titus, who is the pastor, needs to set the example by being faithful to sound teaching. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Again, starting with the word of contrast, like but, you know, it stands out. So Paul's, Paul is setting Titus apart from these false teachers and rebellious men that, that, that were at the end of chapter 1. Uh, those guys are rebels. Titus is not. Those guys are false teachers. Titus speaks the truth. There's, there's a vast difference between those false teachers and rebellious men and Titus. Uh, the next phrase that I kind of want you to notice here is, as for you, right? So uh, Paul's emphasizing Titus and his role here. That's why I say there are two roles when it comes to dealing with men and discipling men in a local church. And, and one of those roles belongs to Titus, who's acting as the pastor of really the island of Crete at this point. Uh, these, there are specific words that Paul has for Titus. Now, uh, Paul doesn't give Titus instructions about how to live in like a godly way. It's not like, uh, listen, you know, Titus, uh, you know, read your Bible, and read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray, you know, is that how the song goes? Is some, do I have it wrong? And you will grow, 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 you know, it's, it's not like one of those things. You know, Titus already, he's already, he's, he's already a godly person. Titus is already a seasoned veteran. He is a, you know, when I was in, um, <clears throat> when I was in Bible college, he used to have to fill out these, these little, uh, did you have to do those in, at Nortland? Um, but you went to, you went to Nortland. Yeah. Um, did you have to have those little ministry things you had to fill out that showed that you did service in the local church and, and then you were like, you're just, you had to have a discipler and the discipler had to tell, like, had to circle where you were on like the, did you have anything like that? You're just supposed to do it, and it was kind of left up to you to do. Well, we had to like fill out forms, and so we had to have a discipler who would kind of like critique us each semester and have to kind of like, this is where on a scale of one to ten his you know leadership is. This is where his preaching is. This is where his service is. Dot 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 dot. And and is he a disciple? Is he a discipler? Is he you know dot dot dot? And and I'll tell you, man, it was kind of a drag. It was it was just like oh, you know. It was so stressful. I don't know why it was so stressful. It wasn't graded or anything. It wasn't, but it was like, if you're not doing service, you're not staying in our school. Uh, but, the, but the top of the food chain, so to speak, in that ministry handbook, I think I still have copies of it. The top of the food chain of that ministry handbook was the discipler. Titus is a discipler. 
All right, he's, he's someone who is discipling people. He's helping them grow closer to the Lord. That's his job. Uh, Paul doesn't give Titus instructions about how to live in a godly way because the presumption is that he shouldn't be discipling if he isn't already living in a godly way. Does that make sense? He's giving Titus, uh, he's giving Titus uh, instructions about how to pastor, about how to be a pastor. And the first charge that he gives here, you might say really the only charge in today's passage, is that he must be committed to sound doctrine, that he must speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Without sound doctrine, all is lost. How can you know God better if you don't know what God says is good and right? How can you serve God better if you don't know what God says in His Word? You can't. That's why sound doctrine is so important. That's why you can't ignore it. Titus must remain committed to it. He must speak it here in verse 1. And he must teach his congregation the truths of the Word of God. This is what sets Titus apart from the false teachers. They're teaching teaching falsehoods. He's teaching sound doctrine. Titus needs to speak sound doctrine, but he also needs to appoint pastors who speak sound doctrine. Remember, that's why he's there, right? To appoint men in every town. And then we have a description of what those men are supposed to look like in verses 5 and following. Uh, actually, uh, take a look here. <clears throat> Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word. Just a chapter earlier, which is in accordance with the teaching, with the doctrine, with sound doctrine, so that he'll be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. Again, this is perhaps one of the most important. You might say, uh, I don't know if I want to say the most important, because if a guy has, if a guy is, if he knows sound doctrine, but he's living like a hypocrite, that's a problem. This is one of the most important aspects of our qualifications of a pastor today. The first thing you look for, the first thing you want to look for is, does he hold sound doctrine? The old sound doctrine. It's a little harder to see how a guy lives. It really is. Like, you don't really know what my life is like on a daily basis. It's, it's a little harder. Like, you, you, sometimes guys slip through the cracks, and then you kind of figure out, oh, man, boy, did we blow that one. You know, we got the wrong guy in there. You know, this is not a good dude. But, um, you, you know, people can put on a show for a period of time. They can do that. So I would say, you want to watch a guy's life, but you want to make sure that he, is, that he holds to sound doctrine. And the hope is that if he's holding the sound doctrine, if he's in the Word of God, then that's going to filter through his life. That's not always true. That's, that hasn't always been true in even this church in its history. There have been guys in this church who held sound doctrine, but man, their lives, if you only knew. There are things I've come to find out about things that have happened in our church Oh, man. People who held sound doctrine, but wow. That's all you can say. And that's, well, you can say a lot worse things. I could, I could say that. A guy cannot teach godliness if he doesn't understand sound doctrine. He can't disciple a person properly. He can't disciple men properly if he doesn't understand sound doctrine. He must teach God's truth. Titus must teach God's truth. He does this publicly in his preaching and teaching. He does it privately in, in, in the way he handles himself in his life. And so the way Titus prays teaches people. The way he handles problems teaches people. Sound doctrine doesn't stop in your public proclamations. It continues in your daily life. Your daily life is reflected by the doctrine that you hold to. I think too many people claim to hold sound doctrine, but in their lives, it's like, eh, you know... I hold those truths, but those truths aren't evident in the way I live and in the way I walk and in the things I'm committed to. Paul, he's about to give Titus instructions on how to disciple various categories of people in the churches of Crete. But without sound doctrine, it is nearly impossible Sound doctrine is the core of any discipleship that takes place. And so when we're looking at this first part, this first movement of today's, today's passage we're looking at, this is the pastor's 
the pastor's responsibility, all right? Sound doctrine. Uh, it, it is at the core of the pastoral task, which is, by the way, why training matters, right? Training matters. Today's Christian is content to have an untrained but dynamic pastor, right? And uh, they're happy with a guy who's interesting but doesn't understand how to properly handle the text of Scripture. Uh, that, I would say, is a mistake. That's part of the reason why Christianity is so biblically illiterate. That's part of the reason why the cults are becoming increasingly more popular. It's part of the reason why the charismatic movement is becoming one of the most popular movements within Christendom, because they don't care about training. They just care about dynamic people. And the charismatic movement is full of guys who have charisma, right? In, you know, pers- personalities that have charisma and and are dynamic personalities, but they don't have an understanding of the Word of God. And they don't require it, and they don't expect it. Seminary teaches you important things like how to, how to interpret the text of Scripture, uh, biblical backgrounds, theological things you'd never even think about. There are things I studied, I'm like, really? Like someone actually came up with this and thought about this? and had to, you know, I would never have even thought of that thing. But there are people out there that have thought of those things, and there's every wind of false doctrine available out there, and you learn about just about every one of them at some point. You, you learn about historical heresies, heresies that are held today that if people only knew the root and the extent of that heresy, they would never believe that stuff today. It bridges the gap of 2,000 years between us and Bible times. Uh, I would argue as well that like seminary, for instance, is a, it, it is a grueling pro. It's a test. You know, some of the hardest years of my life were the years I was in seminary. Just like I don't think I could do this, and um, and you're, you're there's a strain put on you, and and then you have these godly men who are watching your life to see, are you are you cut out for ministry? I would say that most of today's pastors um, they. They want to speak sound doctrine, but they don't understand sound doctrine. They haven't been trained in sound doctrine. They don't even know how to, how to look at the Word of God to, to really gather sound doctrine from the text. And most of the stuff that we hold to ends up just being stuff that we get spoon-fed. All right? and, and that's just, you know, our traditions end up becoming so important, but we don't even understand why we believe a lot of times. And I think a lot of pastors are in that spot. They're in, they're in that role. They're in that position. A lot of pastors, I would say, are just hucksters who want to take the shortcut. They don't want to go through the hard work. They don't want their lives to be examined. They don't want their calling, which in their mind is a subjective feeling only, right? I am called to preach. How do you know? Because because that's what I feel. And you're like, well, well, that's not it. I'm not saying there's no subjectivity to it at all. But uh, they don't want someone questioning their quote-unquote calling. And that's pride, and that's arrogance, and that's narcissism. And it often leads to false doctrine. Uh, Misleading the masses, giving them what they want because they don't hold to this most important thing. Sound doctrine. You can't train men if you don't have sound doctrine. I think I brought it up in the last couple of weeks, talking to a guy some time back, and he had these wild, non, I would say, unbiblical ideas about what he should be doing in life. And I'm just trying to talk sense in this guy. I'm just trying to show him what Scripture says, and he's just like, well, my people, my counselors are telling me this. Just like, who are your counselors that they would say this? And how can you not know that that's bad counsel? How can you not know that that's not sound doctrine? How can you not know that that stands in contradiction to what God says? How can you not know this? You know, and and, and the answer to that comes, the second part that we'll look at here here in a second. But um, I think some of the problem is because the church is okay with, pastors who are not committed to sound doctrine. And so the biblical pastor must be grounded in this, in sound doctrine. And that sound doctrine will drive how he disciples various groups of people like 
men. So in verse 1, it's really the pastor's role in discipleship. And verse 2, it's really uh, the role of man, the role of men, right? Men. You know what I mean. All right, it's the role of men. We see that in verse 2. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and perseverance. Here Paul is writing about older men, an old man or an aged man, according to uh, the the leading Greek lexicon of the day. Um, This word, by the way, is similar to, it's it's similar but different uh, to the word for uh, elder or pastor. Uh, anyway, uh, the question I ask when I look at that is, who, who is an older man? Because when I think of older men, I, you know, I don't want to put a number on it, but I, you know, there's a number, right, in my mind. There's, like, 45 isn't it. You know what I mean? Like, 50 isn't quite it yet, you know, but uh, I'm not going to put the number exactly, but you have the general feel for what I'm thinking when I'm thinking of older men, right? So uh, maybe it's 90, maybe it's 60s, I don't know, well, you, you, you figure it out. But, um, well, you know, when I think of older men, I, I think, you know, the guy who probably gets the, the senior discount for, for breakfast at the diner, right? That's somewhere in that general category, right? You know, that's, that's an older man. But uh, is that what Paul, is that what Paul's thinking? Is that what Paul means here as he writes to Titus? Is it a 60-year-old man? Is it a 70-year-old man, an 80-year-old man? Is it Mr. Metcalf? You know, uh, Yarbrough says that lifespans were short in antiquity, and he says that at times in the Roman Empire, that the lifespan of men was between 25 and 30 years. Um, now, again, that's, uh, I mean, to me, it seems incredibly young, but, um, you know, war and famine would have a big effect on that. And, of course, uh, you know, the medical world, like we live in a time where, Man, I mean, just what happened in the last year and a half without, without modern medicine could have been a very different story. A lot of people might not have made it without modern medicine. I don't even know what would have happened to me um, without modern medicine because uh, <clears throat> even with it, I had some problems. But uh, we can live quite a bit longer. You know, the consensus of theologians seem, the consensus seems to think that um, we're probably talking about 40 to 50-year-old men and up which is a little bit younger than, than I would think when I think of older men. Uh, and by that classification, I'm kind of borderline on that. You know, I'm 43, so if it's 40 to 50 on up, I'm almost there, right? You know how we start to deny, like, what we really are? You know, where we start to think. At some point in life, you start thinking of yourself, like, you start, you used to be like, oh, yeah, man, I can't wait till I'm 16, can't wait till I'm 20, you know, man, when I'm 25 or whatever. And now it's just like, uh, you, you know, uh, kind of 43, I, I peaked at 35, you know what I mean? <laughs> or peaked at, I think I peaked at 28 it's, you know, or something like that. I don't know. Uh, you, you start kind of uh, not embracing the age. You start realizing, listen, you know, I'm, I'm probably, I probably lived 50% of my days. And then you start calculating the numbers, like, have I lived 75% of my days? You know, if, I, if I'm able to, to, to live out my days, uh, you know, in health or whatever else. Uh, and so by some estimates of modern theologians, I would be considered an older man. And uh, if that's the case, and I'm not sure, I can't say for sure, if that's the case, then this is really a reference to mature men, to, to middle-aged and mature men, to adult men. Maybe not in their 20s or 30s, but, but men, most men. Not, there are the young men, and then there's men. And this would probably be a reference to the men who are probably, you know, you're, you can't really call yourself young so much anymore. When I was a kid, I thought 40 was old, right? We talk about this. You know, 40 was an old man. We had a guy in our church, he was like 36, and he was old. Now, he looked old. He did. He looked old. You know, there are guys who are like 35, and they look like they're like 55, this guy looked like, I mean, you know, I don't want to give the, 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 the characteristics that made him look old because I kind of feel bad about, about that. Um, but the guy looked old, and, and he looks older today, trust me. But, um, you know, there are guys who look 70, who are 70, and they look 80, right? And there are guys who are, who are 60, and they, they look a lot younger than that. Well, this guy wasn't, he was, he was the first. And uh, now, you know, 
40 and 50, you know, it doesn't really seem, doesn't really seem that old. So if I'm thinking of this in, in, in American, I'm thinking the guy who gets the discount at the diner because he's got the card that says he's old enough to get that discount. But in the original language, it was probably more like me. Probably more like me. Yeah. Joe, you know, you're now in your fifth decade of life. So uh, you probably, probably qualify. I'm not sure. Are you, are you, I don't know if you qualify or not. Yeah, you're, you're 40. Okay. You just make the cut. Probably, really? Just looking around the room here. Almost every guy in this room. It's probably, probably that. It's probably what, what Paul's talking about. And so this is about us. This is about us. Uh, now, of course, these, uh, these charges to older men, it's not like younger men can't hear these. Older men are to be the example. They're to be discipled in these things. Younger men are as well. But the, listen, older, mature men can have an impact on younger men around them for good and not for evil. Uh, anyway... <clears throat> There's the old statement that I love to quote. You can be young only once, but you can be immature indefinitely. And, uh, and that is something that I've seen quite a bit. Paul's giving Titus instructions on how to, to disciple what our culture would call middle-aged, you know, full-grown men. You know, something like that. I don't know. What would you call a guy 40 and up? Can you call him middle-aged? I think middle-aged is probably... You're a middle-aged man. How does that make you feel? <laughs> I don't think of you. I don't think of either of you guys as middle-aged. I don't really think of myself as a middle-aged guy. But, but that's, that's really, you know, Paul's giving instructions on how to disciple men our age and up. Older men need to be temperate. All right, so that's sober-minded, being able to control yourself, self-controlled, level-headed. Mature believers are level-headed. They're able to control themselves. Uh, I would say that the uh, mature Christian man here needs to be level-headed. He needs to think reasonably. He needs to be able to compare things against the context of Scripture. Last year, if we're putting in the definition, which is appropriate, level-headed, this is as nice as I can write, so just trust that that's what it says. All you really need is the first and last letter of a word. You could just about read anything in its context, level-headed. If you put that word in there, would you say that men overall were level-headed in the past year and a half? I mean, I don't know about you, but I would say they were the most unlevel-headed that I've ever seen in my lifetime. Um, and, and, and it was across the board uh, between lost and saved together. Uh, it's also what I would call in the last year and a half me first eschatology. So um, me first eschatology, I don't know if anyone has ever used that term, or I don't know if that's been coined by anyone. But, you know, look what's going on in the world. My world has been disrupted. And since my world has been disrupted, the end must be here. Because heaven forbid, my world gets disrupted unless the rapture is coming. What is that? That's a narcissistic eschatology. In other words, that's you building your theology around you, or in that case, end times theology, around you. Just because your life changed, now all of a sudden, like, God's plan is coming to fruition? Like, no one's life has ever changed before? Like, maybe during the bubonic, bubonic plague, like, that was a thing, right? Or the Spanish flu of 1918? which, by the way, our pandemic is now past that in America. We've now, we have more deaths now in America, I think by almost 100,000, than the Spanish flu. You know, uh, people's lives have changed and drastically, and that didn't mean the end was coming. But people went crazy, and, uh, and the conspiracy theories ran amok. You know, conspiracy theories, we'll talk about that again at some point, um, probably in this letter. You know, it was, they're, they're just designed 
they're just designed to cause fear. And they're just designed to, 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 to make you either fearful or angry that there's some external force that's in control of these things that, that's causing injustice. Mean, meanwhile, it's like completely removing, hey, listen, God is sovereign over all this. And so what difference does it make in your life as a Christian if Bill Gates were actually the Antichrist, which he isn't? He's not a good dude, but no, he's not, he's not the one. He's not the Antichrist, okay? Um, the Antichrist is a Roman in Scripture. Conspiracy theories ran amok, and there was a complete lack of level-headedness in our world. Uh, during times like those, sound doctrine had to drive our thinking. And so many men uh, exposed themselves by not allowing sound doctrine to drive their thinking. And thus, they didn't have a level head. And it wasn't just the ones who were supposed to be discipled, that is, the verse 2 guys, the men, it was the ones who were supposed to be discipling. The verse 1 guys, the pastors. The pastors had an equally unlevel head. And now, everyone wants to just drop it and pretend like it didn't happen and pretend like all the craziness that they brought out never really took place. Especially the pastors who bought into all that craziness. But that stuff exposed that those guys were not committed to sound doctrine. They were committed to every wind of doctrine. And they led the masses in not being level-headed. Uh, the biblical pastor must disciple his people to be self-controlled and sober-minded. Uh, the Titus needs to disciple older men to be temperate, to be dignified in that word, and we'll move through these a little bit quicker because uh, I do want to get us out a little, I want to be a little shorter, a little, little, little quicker tonight. It's a rare word, shows up three times in the New Testament beyond this passage. And one of them is uh, talking about deacons' wives in First Timothy 3, and one of them is Philippians 4, whatsoever is honorable, it's the word honorable there. Uh, in the context, it means evoking special respect, being worthy of respect, being noble, being dignified, being serious. It's, it's a reference to a noble dignity that marks a godly person's life. Uh, and godliness emanates from his life. And so the biblical pastor needs to disciple older men to be temperate, to be dignified, to be sensible, and, and this is kind of connected, right? Being in control of oneself is what the word means, to be prudent, thoughtful, self-controlled. There's really a certain parallel with that word temperate there. Um, but it's similar to the word for wisdom. He needs to have wisdom in the way he acts. One guy says, fickleness, rash passion. Say that like five times or 15 times fast. Fast, rash passion. Rash passion. I don't know why I struggled with that one, but anyway. Fickleness, rash passion, and impulsiveness should be things of the past for men in this stage of life, now that they're engaged in Christian life and service. And he's right about that. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Uh, many older men and middle-aged men are fickle. That is, they change their loyalties frequently. They hop from place to place or from church to church at every wind uh, of change that happens. And as soon as they hear something they don't like, that is, as soon as their opinion is questioned, they, they leave. Now, there are certainly some sound reasons to leave. My experience has been here that that hasn't often been the case. Hasn't often been biblical reasons. And so that would display a person who's fickle. Fickle. Um, too many middle-aged men uh, or older men have rash passion. That is, they don't think things through carefully or biblically. They don't consider the consequences of their action, their actions and their, their um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, well, yeah, impulsive. I already said impulsive. Sorry impulsive. All right, so older men are to be discipled, to be temperate, to be dignified, to be sensible, to be 
and I'm going to treat these together, sound in faith, in love, and perseverance. Sound in faith, sound in love, sound in perseverance. So the, 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 the godly man who is being, the man who is being discipled needs to learn to be godly. He needs to be, learn to be sound, spiritually mature, spiritually healthy. We live by faith and not by sight. Uh, their understanding of scripture, the sound doctrine which is spoken by the spiritual leaders, uh, trickles into their life such that it starts determining how they live and the decisions that they make. Things like, things like where I'm working or obviously my commitment to the local church or who I'm going to marry or who, how I'm going to handle my marriage or how I'm going to raise my kids or what I'm going to teach them that's important or, you know, those types of things, right? Now, some of those things, like who I'm going to marry, doesn't, they don't always apply to older men, but they do sometimes apply. Have you ever met a middle-aged man who, who's single? I'm going to tell you, I've met middle-aged church people who were single and who did not allow sound doctrine to determine the way they thought about how they were going to gain a wife. And so that certainly applies. The Christian man is to practice Scripture. He is to display maturity through acts of love and through his perseverance in faith. The church needs guys like this. They need spiritually mature men. A wife needs a spiritually mature husband. She does. Children need their fathers to be spiritually mature. We need men who will take the truth of the Word of God and swallow their pride. Because too often that doesn't happen. Too often men get angry when they hear something they don't like or when they feel like they feel the slightest sense of conviction then they feel that maybe like the message was against them or something like that. They get angry. Often when you hear truth, especially truth that applies to your life, that implies that you need to change something, the responses are either one, I get angry, or two, I humble myself and repent. Usually, those are just about the only two options. I find that many men choose getting angry we need men who receive the truth of God and swallow their pride, who receive the truth of the word of God and forsake worldliness, who receive the truth of the word of God and faithfully pass it on. The island of Crete has a problem, and that problem is false doctrine. It's rampant, and it's affecting, and it's affecting people's maturity. There's immaturity, spiritual immaturity on the island of Crete. And when you look at an island of Crete, the island of Crete, and we think about the problems that were connected to that island and what Titus' responsibility was there, how can you not think about the parallels between Crete and America? How can you not think about the parallels between the Cretans and the American church? One of the solutions to the problem at Crete Remember, Titus was to set in order what remains. He was to fix things. One of the solutions was to disciple men. And that discipleship had to be based on sound doctrine. Had to be based on the word of God. The pastor's role was to speak. As for you, speak things that are fitting for sound doctrine. Speak the word of God. The men's role was to receive that. Really was to receive that, was to be, the men's role was to be discipled in the ways that Paul wrote. And that's not everything they were to be discipled in, just a few characteristics of spiritual maturity, just a few characteristics of godliness that the men were to be. When men are discipled, they learn to be followers of Christ. And uh, they learn to be leaders of the home. Uh, and they learn to lead their families in that path, or at least to be the, you know, whatever it is, the anchor of their house, spiritually. And yes, men are supposed to be leaders of their homes. Uh, ladies, I didn't say it. God did. 
Right, as Pastor Thorne used to say, men are, you know, the world will say, oh, that's chauvinistic. That's sexist. American society will frown upon that because, again, they want to obliterate the lines that God, that God has created men and women. Okay? And God has given roles to both in Scripture. The world wants to obliterate that. But when godly men lead, families grow closer to the Lord. People get saved. Men get saved. You know, most of the time, men will go to work, they won't say anything about the Lord. I, 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 I suspect that uh, there's a lot of Christian men who the people around them have no idea that they're even Christians. Men need to be discipled in spiritual maturity. They need to be discipled in perseverance. And too many refuse to be a disciple because they are the supreme authority of their lives. They are the chief spiritual expert. Uh, are we stubborn uh, men? Uh, we can be. We can be, you know. Um, you know, there's that kind of, kind of that alpha male type, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm the man. You know, I'm the king of my castle. And as soon as someone else tells me, there are things in your life that you need to repent of, the tendency can be, you know, who are you? I'm the king of my castle. I'm the head Indian, or whatever, the chief. I'm the, I'm the dude in charge. Instead of humbling themselves and hearing what God's word says. In this passage and in the weeks to come, we see that qualified pastors need to disciple people. And in today's passage, they need to disciple men in the word of God to disciple them to be spiritually mature. Um, we're going to take our hymnals and turn to 319 to close our service with a hymn. If